Good afternoon, everybody. Welcome to Tree School Online. Our webinar today features Dana Sanchez, and we're going to learn about coyotes, wild and free. And if you feel like howling, there will be some opportunities. Dana has some howls for us. Um, I guarantee you it'll be inspirational. So thank you very much for being here. I'm Mike Clossy, Director of Forestry with the Oregon Forest Resources Institute. And it's my pleasure to be your host for this afternoon's webinar. Tree School Online is a production of the Oregon State University Forestry and Natural Resources Extension Program and the Partnership for Forestry Education. And we want to give special recognition to OFRI for leading this project and to the U.S. Forest Service and the Oregon Department of Forestry for giving us a grant to cover our expenses. Tree School online webinars are scheduled every Tuesday, one in the morning at 10 a.m. and one in the afternoon, such as this one, at 3 p.m. Um, from now until July 28th. They're also being recorded um, or re-recorded and stored online so that you, people that miss them can access them. Before I introduce Dana and we start the webinar, I have just a few housekeeping things. Many of you are familiar with Zoom and Zoom webinars but I like to go through our process just so you're comfortable with it. First of all, the audio is muted for you. You can holler at us as loud as you want and we will not hear you. So that's a good thing. Um, same with your video. You don't have access to your video camera in Zoom webinar, so we can't see you, but just you can see us. Um, we can keep track of you in a couple of different ways. Um, we have a list of participants and we can see who you are. We also have across the bottom of the Zoom webinar, um, there's a Q&A box and that is where we would like you to put your written questions in. Um, unfortunately, we're not set up to handle audio questions only in writing, but we'd like you to write them there in the Q&A. And specifically this class being on wildlife today, there's a whole range of issues, a whole range of questions that may be really complex. So we also, in the chat box, which is just to the right of the Q&A, um, Julie is monitoring that. We don't want you to put your questions in there, but in there are gonna be useful links that you can use, including a link to um, a service from Extension called Ask an Expert. And if, if you want to ask really tough questions or you do ask, not that Dana can't handle tough questions, but if it's something that's going to take a bunch of research, um, we'd rather have you have, get it right. So we, we will send your question to there. And what we will do is we'll just put a note, you get a written response to your question that said, please send this to ask an expert. But most coyote questions um, we're going to be able to deal with today. That's what we're here for and Dana will be able to answer those. So we, at the end of the talk, we'll have a break for Q&A and they will come up and I will monitor them and ask Dana and she will answer them. So that should work pretty cool. We've had really good luck with getting a lot of questions through Q&A. It's been very successful for us. The next thing that we're gonna have to get your feedback is we use polls. And these will pop up in a couple different times, one at the beginning where we find out who you are and one at the end where we find out how we've done. And I will start it and it should just pop up on your screen as a pop-up box. But for some people's computer setups, it won't. And what you need to do down in the Zoom pool, toolbar, when I initiate a poll, it'll light up that says polls. You need to click on that and then the poll will pop up. And then on a small percentage of people, the polls don't work at all because the pop-up blockers are smarter than Zoom, and so we just can't get them all, but we try. Finally, as I said, the, the webinar today is going to be recorded, and we also are going to have some resources posted. So Dana is going to put together a collection of resources, and they will be available online at the Tree School online webpage. So I think that covers it for housekeeping. So now it's my great pleasure to introduce uh, Dana Sanchez. You can turn your camera on, Dana, and unmute. Dana is a professor and extension wildlife specialist at OSU. Um, I've known her for a long time. Mostly we see each other at Tree School, and here we're yeah, seeing each other at Tree School exactly. online. So uh, welcome, Dana, right. and tell us what Thank you're going to you. tell us about. Yeah. Um, are you able to see my slides? Yes, you can see your slide fine. Okay. Excellent. Thank you. 
Well, it's my pleasure to get to talk to you uh, today in this new venue about coyotes, they're exciting and very fascinating creatures. Um, I will be looking forward to your questions. And um, I just wanted to show you my 3D printed coyote skull that I had hoped to share with you wow. in person. I'll just hold it up at some point. Shall I go ahead and advance? Yeah, go ahead and we'll do the poll. I think is the next one the poll slide. Okay. Uh, let's see. Oh, so this is just you. There okay. So before we kick into Dana's presentation, I have a poll for y'all. And this really is to find out who you are. So you should be able to vote now. Um, we, we had, the first question is, where are you from? Willamette Valley, Coastal Oregon, Southwest, Central or Eastern, Washington State, within the USA, but not Oregon or Washington, outside the USA. Um, then if you scroll down, who are you about yourself? Um, are you a woodland owner, private natural resource professional, agency professional, or others? And then final question is, how many acres of forest land do you own or manage? And so far, the answers look like about what we've seen. Um, about 78% so far are from the Willamette Valley. 70% um, are woodland owners. And uh, most people own somewhere between 10 and 100 acres. So. Um, we've got about 80% have voted, so my theory is about 80% is what we get. So I'm going to show you the answers. So this is what you said, 73% uh, Willamette Valley, smattering from throughout, 8% Washington State, 8% outside of Washington and Oregon and USA, and no um, out-of-country folks yet, 67% woodland owners, a few agency natural resource professionals, and the others, um, I'm wondering, or they could be just a people that love wildlife. Um, there's a lot of that out there. Maybe coyote fans. Um, they used to watch Roadrunner on TV and always rooted for the coyote. That, those guys are in the other. And then finally, how much land do people own? Again, 40 acres is about where we're at, 10 to 40. It goes up to 100. Oh, good. So thank you for participating in the poll. Um, and we will move onward. So I'm going to shut off so you can just look at Dana and her slides and not me. So thanks, Dana. All right. Thank you. As, how's my volume? Good? Okay. That's it's well, good. It yes. is good. Thank you. It is my pleasure to get to talk to you about coyotes today. Uh, they are ubiquitous through American cultures. And I have just a few images here to help us remember how all the many ways that they have made it into our culture. Uh, interestingly, most of the Native American cultures have some sort of story involving coyote, uh, but interestingly, even further, is that their role and their character, shall we say, in those legends is quite variable across and among the different regions. So one of the key uh, legends in which coyotes involved um, is the bringer of fire. So you see in the bottom right, and that could be a fox. Uh, in some versions, this is a fox. In other versions of the legends, it's a coyote. But it, the coyote character played a key role in rescuing humans from an everlasting winter by stealing back either the fire or sun depending on the version, and bringing our seasons back to us. Um, so it's really interesting, and it's not at all surprising that so many of us have interests in coyotes, because even to this day, uh, many of us would have stories or, or personal experiences with them, as well as maybe some very long-term cultural ties to their character. They're often de uh, displayed as a trickster or something that's clever. Um, sometimes that's given a positive aspect and sometimes a negative aspect. So really not much different than, again, our current cultural uh, incorporation of Coyote as a character. Now, ecologically, they play uh, the role as predators, so they can chase down and find their own animal food. 
they are, I would say the word that I would really tag them with is that they're opportunistic. And the other word there, omnivores, means an animal that eats virtually anything. So the coyote of many creatures here on the North American continent really exemplifies the flexibility, the adaptability to be opportunistic in perceiving what is available, what is the highest dietary value, and being able to shift their diet to that. They also play important roles as scavengers. And sometimes the opportunism and, and the scavenging are amazing. So I just today read a biologist report from years ago of observing a coyote racing at top speed alongside I-84 and judging traffic, jumping through a fence, jumping into the, the, the lanes of traffic in between cars, grabbing a rabbit that had been killed by traffic and zipping back out and making it through the fence all in a matter of seconds that the people could keep the animal in view. So that is a really amazing example of being opportunistic and scavenging. And clearly that individual had learned of that roadway as a risky but rich opportunity to find food. Now, having said that, their diet can range from small mammals uh, to small-bodied, uh, what we would think of as large animals, such as fawns, possibly at times with larger pack sizes, even being able to take larger size or adult deer. They will opportunistically switch to being a primarily fruit and vegetable eating animal in the uh, apple producing section of Washington, for example, during uh, downed apple season towards the fall they can switch up to 80% of their diet being downed apples. I mentioned carrion or scavenging animals that are already dead, whether that's from a roadway or another source of mortality. In some seasons, in some regions, large insects such as the larger grasshoppers can constitute a large part of the diet for one season. And then finally at the bottom here, Coyote of all the characters in North America is really adaptable to learning about the foods that we humans can provide. That might be pet food, bird seed, animals, or plants that we're growing for our own food and what we would consider garbage sometimes. So their Latin name, Canis latrans, comes from the term barking dog. And as I play some sound files you know, later, and probably from your own memory of encountering the animal, they do bark as part of their vocalizations. They're a fairly medium-sized predator. The size, the body sizes, as well as the complex coat colors vary significantly geographically across what is now their geographic range. I will note this, uh, this term I used, countershading, is a common one in uh, ecology in which an animal has darker colors above and then their belly tends to be light or buff colored so that they essentially look like they don't stand out as well against the sky to an animal that's shorter than they are or lower than they are. And that's very common both among predators and prey. So here's one of the sounds. I'll try not to overwhelm us. So this is an example of some of the yipping and howling by a single animal. And they have a very flexible social system that again, uh, this is going to come up over and over again with this species. It's a very plastic or flexible uh, species in terms of how they organize themselves, uh, either individuals, pairs, or what we would call packs or groups. Pack size or group size is largely dependent on the amount of prey that's available as well as how large that prey is. So as you can imagine, 
larger prey takes more partners to collective, uh, collectively communicate and coordinate a hunt in order to be successful. The flip side of that is that the more animals you have in your group, the more mouths there literally are to feed. So coyote is very good at adapting their social behavior or their group size to the conditions available to them. They are very highly communicative. They are, as I already mentioned, they literally are able to communicate and coordinate as they move through a landscape, as they hunt or seek for food, or if one gets challenged by a potential predator or a competitor. They are by nature secretive and what we would call crepuscular. So limiting themselves to being most active in those semi-dark times uh, as well as during darkness. So extremely early in the morning uh, to through the night and as evening is rising. Having said that, they are among our most adaptable wildlife species. They easily adapt and habituate to the presence of human beings in our urban and suburban settings. As well as if you think in the rural uh, settings, they quickly learn about things like hay mowing and that that can be a great opportunity to find prey as long as they manage the risk well. So they do modify what starts as their baseline times of behavior to best suit them in our various environments. This is a picture, this is a rough picture of where we believe coyotes once lived versus where they're found now. And what you can see is a large and significant range expansion. Now, this map is not saying that there are significant populations of coyotes throughout all of the areas depicted on this map, but it's showing what we call a geographic range scale of where they can be found potentially. I would also say that the more we have learned about the species that we call the red wolf on the eastern seaboard, the more we have learned or the more questions we've raised about whether there was a coyote in the eastern seaboard uh, that was there and possibly removed or reduced before we started building range maps for the species. So let's talk about their cycle in terms of reproduction and survival. The average litter size for a coyote, and I mean average, so that can have some extremes as well, higher or lower, is six pups. That's starting out. They have a fairly long or broad breeding season. So here in Oregon, depending on conditions quite often, how, how well, uh, mom's been fed, for example, they could start breeding in January and they could be breeding still in April. We generally have been saying that the peak of uh, reproduction is happening March to mid-April. Very similar to our pet dogs, they have a 60-day gestation, whereas dogs generally have a 63-day gestation or pregnancy length. And their pups are especially vulnerable to predation, including to non-family coyotes for the first two and a half months of their lives. Then as they start getting mobile and curious, things like roadkill, uh, raptors, things that are outside their little safe den that's being protected by their mom and family, they start falling prey to their own curiosity quite often, such that fewer than 50% of them likely make it to their first summer. So it can be a very low uh, survival rate among those puppies. I'm often asked to talk about and address 
human wildlife conflicts. And I found it's really interesting and helpful to think about what are the demands on the animals that we're encountering that might be helping to drive that conflict dynamic. So in terms of coyotes, definitely reproduction and then the results of that reproduction um, are driving many of the pressures on the individual animals, especially the adults, uh, during breeding season. That's a very energetically stressful time, not only to support the pregnancy, but then to support a nursing mother with six or more pups. And then as very soon in their development, not only is mom and the pack having to manage the dietary needs for those pups, so they begin moving beyond the milk diet to needing to be extra mouths hunted for. But as I already mentioned, they start getting curious and there is a child care management issue to be um, to be addressed to keep the little guys safe from themselves. So there is a lot of nutritional and time stress on the adults involved in that litter. By six months old, the pets are starting the very intensive business of learning how to be animals that, as I like to say, have to make their living by chasing things down and killing it with their mouths. And that's a tricky thing to learn. So at six months old, they are beginning to learn the art and science of hunting and making a living, uh, depending on their own skills, as well as that very important social aspect of how do you hunt with others. And if you've ever raised puppies, you know how enthusiastic they can get about, they get so excited when they see the prey, whether you're training a retriever or a pointer or a terrier, they get so excited. So the adults are having to teach them how to recognize, how to stalk, how to curb their enthusiasm long enough to be effective. The pups at that point are at a very critical stage of being vulnerable to learning that humans can be a valuable source of food. And that is one of the touch points where we humans can help the pups learn that no, humans are not actually safe. We're actually quite scary and smelly and loud. And no, we're not going to inadvertently provide you food. And then having, assuming they have survived that critical stage of learning, hopefully without learning to come to humans for food, they, there is a decision made not only by the individuals, but also by the family members as to whether this young coyote gets to remain with the pack longer or whether they're going to essentially be driven off to find their own space in the very scary, dangerous world. Now, similarly to what you've probably heard about with cougars and bears, that teenage level is when young animals are under high nutritional stress, high every form of stress. They're out on their own. They've got to make a living. They're very hungry, and they may or may not have absorbed all the lessons that they were taught about how to make a living. So again, this is a critical time when they may be willing to take more risks than their parents told them to allow. They may be open to learning really bad habits. So those are good things to keep in mind as we manage the interface between human and coyote habitat. So coyote management through time has been fairly harsh and systematic up until about the 1970s, maybe even into the 80s. The main goal was to totally eliminate the animals, at least from certain regions or areas. So through that time from European settlement to the 1970s, obviously our tools available have changed, our methods have changed in their availability. But again, the main goal was to manage the risk 
of coyotes damaging primarily agricultural animals by removing the coyote from the equation. Um, what we learned through that period of time that it, is that it's very intensive and costly. We never, and I can say use the N word never confidently here, we never achieve total control of the species in any of those areas because what we were creating were vacuums that were then occupied by the next set of teenage wool, uh, coyotes looking for a new home. We inadvertently and without intentionally doing so have artificially selected for some of the most intelligent, fast learning and wary animals. And where we were doing high population reductions, we often left the youngest, most fertile animals behind, which led to high uh, reproductive rate populations where we were trying to reduce the population in the first place. We've shifted in paradigm now, hopefully in, in many places, to more being more efficient with our efforts and our investments in managing that conflict interface so that we reduce deaths among non-target animals, for one thing, we target specific animals that have learned all the bad behaviors and remove them. And we have thus reduced our risk of inflating reproductive rates that would otherwise make problems worse. And we're also learning to use combinations of more sustainable methods to reduce losses so that targeted removal of problem individuals, incorporating guard dogs or other guard animals uh, such as llamas and burrows, uh, using different fence combinations, confining animals, uh, livestock animals during critical periods of vulnerability and increasing human presence. Sometimes that's through herding or other uh, ways of increasing human presence among the animals we want to protect. I will also though remind us that the costs of the livestock losses and all the protections are still borne primarily by the individual operators. So it is and can be still a significant problem for people making a living in that um, coyote human interface. There is uh, a rising recognition and interestingly, especially among some of the suburban and urban areas where coyotes are roaming, the recognition of some of the positive contributions such as coyotes do in fact help uh, move around and control uh, sometimes overabundant urban populations of deer uh, and voles and interestingly other uh, conflict species uh, near human homes and yards. But switching to the other side, hand again, there are still in some places killing contests happening with non-selective lethal control. On the urban interface, uh, some of the top concerns that we typically hear regarding coyotes are human safety, obviously would be at the top of that list. Interactions with pets are very commonly also mentioned. Uh, people are concerned quite often for their effects on other wildlife species. They are concerned um, quite often if they see or witness aggressive behavior or what might be aggressive behavior. Um, especially associated with certain locations or places. Um, and then there's interestingly property damage, including agricultural in infrastructure. So apparently, and this is one of the things I've learned through my years with extension, coyotes just have a thing about gnawing the ends off of vineyard um, irrigation lines that are elevated and it's just vexing. It, 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 comes down to a wily coyote type of thing. They just keep going back and back and back. 
And then finally, there are um, sometimes mentioned concerns about potential disease spread by coyotes. Through all of this interaction with coyote in our now modern era, we've created what we call the urbanized coyote. Uh, they have really high survival rates once they survive that pup stage. They tend to have small, relatively resource-rich home ranges or territories. They do, even in the most urbanized areas, still select what we would call the most natural area for their den locations. Now, when I say natural with those tags around it there, uh, sometimes you'd be surprised. That can be in a very busy, high-use human area. But to them, apparently, it's like, this is the best we're going to find. Let's call this forest. Let's go. They essentially have no natural predators or competitors on these urbanized landscapes. Uh, autos are an unnatural uh, but sometimes significant source of mortality in other regions with high amounts of trucking and train shipping. There would be a risk from those as well. And coyotes are sometimes shift to completely nocturnal movement to avoid those high traffic times. Uh, other times they simply shift how they get from one place to another and choose different routes. The, I have a question mark about this. In some studies they've concluded that they have a relative avoidance of development. I think what that means is they still tend to den in the most natural areas, but they limit the time to which they expose themselves to human associated disturbances or risks. And again, there's that word again, opportunistic predators and scavengers. They are not, in any of the literature I've seen, they are not dependent or simply existing because of depredation of pets. That's important. So this image that I found is very troubling. Uh, this was from uh, somewhere in the Bay Area of California, and it was not an unusual situation in, among this human community, and that's why the article was written. Um, so I want to make sure that we're clear on two different, very important ways of learning, or essentially how we train wild animals to be around humans way too much. The first is habituation. That is a behavioral acclimation to the presence of humans. And that can be our physical presence, the presence of our vehicles, of our homes, of our pets, of the noises, of the smells, all the things that are uniquely human, roads, things like that. They, Habituation is essentially the unlearning of a fear response to the point that they feel less, shall we say, anxiety in coming into these spaces. They begin to then see potentially us or our pets or other domestic animals as competitors for the resources within their, those spaces that they're now able to occupy. There are concerns because where does the coyote go poop? And it's going to be doing its waste functions in the areas that it's using. And there could be parasite uh, or waste issues associated with their using those areas uh, where, where we are, where our children, where our pets are moving as well. And habituated in individuals, because they have now unlearned much of their fear of humans, are going to be that much more vulnerable to the next form of training, which is food conditioning. So any of you who have used positive training methods with your dogs, for example, by uh, associating treats with a desirable behavior, have some experience with this. Um, coyotes learn that behavior, risky behaviors or otherwise uh, avoided behaviors such as av coming near to humans might be associated with a food reward. 
And I have here that good old saying about fed bears are dead bears. Well, even a coyote that will come up and take a treat from somebody's hand or very nearby, we always have to remember whether we're talking about deer or coyotes or bears or bison, <laughs> that a wild animal do, does still have all of its instincts and it's going to have a fight or flight response. So even if it seems tame, if that magic tripwire gets crossed and we or our pets suddenly look like a threat to their survival, they will behave accordingly. If they can't get away quickly enough or if the lane to escape doesn't look open to them, they will go into self-defense mode. And that's where the most severe interactions between humans and wildlife generally happen. And finally, once an animal, an individual animal has been taught that humans really aren't so scary and that they're quite often the uh, producers of tasty food treats, they're going to generalize that to more humans in general. So even if it's just your one neighbor trying to quote train the coyotes to be friendly, they may start approaching you when you're on your walk because humans equal food at that point. So there are some factors in the few cases where coyotes have actually attacked uh, human beings that should have been watchwords now in retrospect. And we, we can watch for these in our own areas to notice if there's a rising trend or an escalation of that habituation or that risk taking by our local coyotes. So certainly, if you know that somebody is giving the animals food rewards, then that is a human behavior that needs to be managed. Um, hopefully it can be simply a constructive conversation among neighbors. Sometimes it can help to enlist the assistance of your district wildlife biologist from your state wildlife and fish management agency to emphasize the danger and the downfalls of that sort of human behavior on the animals. If animals are allowing them to be seen or approached more closely by humans, especially adults, especially full-size adults, and or increased observations of just, you know, what people often call blatant walking down the middle of the street during broad daylight, that can be a sign of escalation. Now, it might be a sign that an animal got jumped out of its day bed and it's just trying to get away from whatever else happened that we didn't see. But if it's becoming a habit, then it's something to which we should pay attention. At the point at which animal coyotes are approaching human beings in any sort of aggressive, way or chasing pets or being defensive of especially human su subsidized food sources. So that might be Fluffy's bowl on the back porch. It might be that spilled bird seed or it might be your chicken coop. Then we have an animal that has learned far too many bad lessons about standing up for itself on the human interface. And it's time to talk to a biologist with the agency. Certainly any direct attacks to pets, um, or rushing joggers or cyclists, that is an immediate red card for that animal. It's likely needing to be removed from the population for everybody's uh, well-being. We also wanna be concerned, you know, I will remind us that coyote, on, along with being highly adaptable and intelligent, they are very good observers. And sometimes their yellow-eyed observations of us or others is simply that. They're just observing. They're like, huh, son of a gun. 
look at that. I wonder what that is. But if they start doing that a little too often in the daytime presence of children, um, that is a cause for concern. Because children in playing, especially younger children, tend to make noises that are very high-pitched and excited. And that may stir in a wild animal's mind the memory of noises that are made by prey animals, which becomes a very alluring thing to check out. So that's something we should pay attention to. And daytime shows of aggression. Now, again, we have to couch that one in what are the circumstances? One of the things, uh, I should go back to that, that I'll talk about in just a moment is because they are going to place their dens in the most natural to them uh, site possible. It's sometimes occurring that an adult has been posted guard duty near a den. And what we don't know is we walk along Birch Street or whatever is that we are coming very close to the tripwire for that den. We have no idea there's a den there, but the adult coyote that's on guard duty does. So we have to think about what is the context. Is it pup rearing season? Um, where are we literally with regards to places that this coyote may not be able to budge on? So we have to always keep context in mind as we interpret these behaviors. So proactively around our homes, obviously number one, please don't feed them. They're very good at foraging on their own. We have to manage those inadvertent, what I call eat at Joe's signs that we sometimes accidentally put out. We certainly don't want to deliberately be baiting them in or feeding them because they will learn that. And like I said, they will expect other humans to be sources of food as well. I'll put some parentheses around eliminate water sources. Here in Western Oregon, there's likely a lot of water available to a coyote out on the landscape. However, if you're in a place where water is a rarity and that could be a, an attractor or kind of like a magnet resource for an animal like a coyote, we might want to consider eliminating that. Secure garbage, and that could be, again, that downed fruit, or it could be just the garbage you're going to put in the bin at the end of the week. And I say secure rodent and coyote edible garbage because, remember, rodents are coyote edible foods themselves. So, again, an ample supply of rodents and a reliable source of rodents can become a point attractant for a coyote. Uh, feed your pets indoors or at least store the, the leftovers and the supply indoors. Coyotes are extremely good among um, our urbanized creatures in what time the meal wagon comes out and whether or not it gets picked up. If you're concerned about coyotes actually hanging out in your yard, you might consider changing that low level of shrub cover. So a coyote looking to have a little day nap or resting area is going to look for a place that's safe for it to lay down because Coyotes are, even on the urban interface, remember, they evolved in a landscape that included larger predators that could kick their bottoms. So they're always looking for that safe, secure spot to hang out. And if that happens to be part of your yard and it's too close to your safe, secure place to hang out, simply raising that lower level of shrub cover so that there's a not a safe spot could be one part of a solution. Fencing a yard at least five and a half feet, probably closer to six to seven feet tall. Um, I recommend if you've got a real issue with coyotes getting in, they are significantly good diggers. 
that you include um, what I would call a mesh apron. So not chicken wire, because it'll rust out, but a mesh apron, either hardware cloth or the fence material itself, extending down at least a foot and out towards the coyote, as I always say, at least 12 inches to try to defeat the under digging that they might do. They sometimes will hit a fence and then back up a foot and try to go under it. And then uh, this innovation called coyote rollers on top that you can see in this photo is to help defeat the overtopping of fences. Some people combine this with a single electric wire or they replace it with a single electric wire. Uh, if you're going to do the electric wire, you might actually want it hanging a little farther out towards the coyotes, so kind of an outrigger, so it prevents them even getting on top. And then finally, uh, making sure that our vulnerable pets or stock, especially those that are needing to visit outdoors at night, have some secure spot. If you're going to want to release them and then go back to what you're doing, eating dinner or something, and then come back and let the animal in or change where it's ranging for the night, having a secure area, um, especially if you're if you realize that you're being observed by coyotes, that is another thing that they will have observed in your routine. When you're out and about and you have coyotes hanging out in the area, uh, I mentioned those interesting noises and behaviors that children, human children make that might be of interest to a curious coyote. Don't leave them unattended. And I also want to remind us that I certainly would have been vulnerable to this as a child. I would have wanted to approach the coyote. I would have been fascinated. Well, is that a dog? It's a very odd looking dog, but I'm going to get closer to it. So we really have to manage that child coyote interface if you're visiting an area. Um, I really encourage us to walk our pets on leashes. Whether you walk a rabbit or a dog or a llama or something like that, having it under your direct control in coyote country is always best. Uh, depending on the breed, it can be so tempting, so, shall we say, beyond the critical thinking stage for a dog that has strong prey drive to not go after the coyote, which may or may not be by itself. We always have to remember that. So having even more than voice control on the animals is really important. I mentioned this earlier, if an, an, if an adult coyote seems to be claiming a particular area of space, think about what, the, what time of year is it? Where are we on the landscape? It's possible that we need to just shift our walking pattern for a week or a few more weeks until the, the family has moved on from that stage. And finally, if you're approached or being closely watched, one, make sure it is a coyote and not a dog. Some of these tactics would trigger a dog that was feeling uneasy or a little hyped up or agitated, whereas a coyote would be more likely to say, well, that human is being big and scary and shaking rocks or throwing rocks. Um, coyote should still recognize when you take that extra energy to be a scary human that it needs to vacate the area. I mentioned the possibility of using electricity as one way to exclude coyotes. That works uh, potentially on the rural interface. It, it all depends when we're making these exclusive barriers, just how much of a space we really need total exclusion. And then that helps inform what level or, or of investment we need to make in the barrier. There are electric net wires uh, primarily produced to contain chickens, for example, and smaller stock. Sometimes that is sufficient for a small area to be protected. 
Uh, we can manage how we uh, handle the birthing seasons for the highly vulnerable juveniles, whatever species they are. We can use light as one of the ways that human presence can be made very obvious. So bright motion controlled light. Uh, there are other strobe lights, noise makers, um, combining that potentially with protective dogs or llamas or other protective animals. Uh, managing the occasional dead animal that sometimes that happens when we're producing animals and nature will remove it, but if that nature removing the dead animal is a coyote, what's happened is it's learned that this is a good place to check out for dinner. Never know, there might be something for me here. Uh, finally, reducing habitat resources or hiding resources near the most vulnerable spots. You don't want to have a safe hanging out observation hiding spot for an animal that's potentially going to depredate your stock. Um, I often get ask this question, why not just move them? Not just for coyotes, but tree squirrels, uh, voles, you name it. Uh, why don't we just move them? Well, across species, what I can tell you is that when we translocate animals, I often liken it to one of us being picked up on a reality show, helicoptered over, and dropped in somebody else's home there's going to be a high risk, especially with carnivores such as coyotes, that the other ones there are not going to appreciate the stranger dropping in on them. And there's a really good chance that they'll be killed by others of their own species through aggression. Also, when you remove an animal from its accustomed home range or territory, it's going to be very vulnerable to all the risks and accidents. It doesn't know where to go for food. It doesn't know how to avoid the other coyotes. It doesn't know about the road system uh, or it's, it doesn't have any data to go on about how to survive in this new place. They're likely to do really poorly. And most animals have homing behavior to some degree, uh, meaning that when we drop them off somewhere, we're not entirely sure how they do this, but most species have a way of orienting back towards the direction from which we've just brought them, and they'll just start moving that direction without regard to eating or sleeping or staying safe. So. Many bad things can happen along the way and are likely to happen along the way. It's also illegal. Uh, we only do translocations occasionally as professional wildlife management uh, professionals. Uh, it's generally when we have a species that is of low reproduction or high conservation risk where we're trying to save every potential breeding individual in a population and we see them as individual resources that we have to try to save. Even in those cases, whether it's mountain goats or, or grizzly bears or, or ferrets or something else, we know that there's, any given individual has less than 50% of a chance of making it. So please don't move animals or think that we should move animals out of kindness because it's really not the kindest thing. Um, and finally, we have both a health uh, animal health issue of potential disease and parasite transmission from a population that's got that issue going on to one that hadn't yet, and the ethical issue of moving a problem animal from one human relationship or community to another where it's likely, it's strongly likely that it will simply fall into the same pattern because that's the pattern it has learned. Uh, in its first human community. So who to call? Coyotes are unregulated predators under our Department of Agriculture regs. Um, they're also managed 
as fur bearers. So there are people who hunt them and trap them to harvest their fur, especially when their coats are full uh, towards winter. But you have to be have the appropriate licenses and work with the appropriate tools uh, and seasons and abide by all the regulations and that uh, to engage in that. When they are depredating agricultural situa situations, um, the USDA Animal Plant and Health Inspection Service, or ACES, can often come in and provide some uh, predator species control by removing animals from the population. On the home, yard, and suburban front, it's more likely that you should probably talk to your district biologist. I've given for Oregon the headquarters phone number so that you can be connected with your local district biologist. And I also have a link here for what we call wildlife control operators. In the state of Oregon, we have a program in which private individuals can be trained and licensed as contractors who offer uh, services, whether that is uh, preventive work or hazing, things like that. And I want to also address the fact that here, at least in Oregon, uh, we are getting increasing questions like, was that a coyote or a wolf? Was that, was that a, what was that? Um, there is a definite and marked difference in sizes. Typically, once somebody has seen a wolf, they know that was a wolf. They are very large animals. Uh, their tracks evidence that. And verbally, I'm going to get this started because it's got a little bit of a lag. There's quite a difference in, literally in the voices that you hear from coyotes that often uh, speak in groups compared to individual howls by wolves. So that was a, the start of a group howl and in chorus by coyotes. And I'm going to try to cue the wolf. Oh no, <laughs> now we've got them both playing. And with that, I'm going to go ahead and close and hand control back over to Mike. All right, excellent, Dana. Um, we got some Thank questions you. for you. So we will okay. ask you to uh, restart that in a minute when we get ready to advertise the next show, but not yet. We can do this just with okay. us up. So people have been great at putting in questions and, and I'll do the first couple first that had to do with the range. Remember at the very beginning, yep. you showed the small range yeah. traditionally and now a very large range. So the first question yes. is, the historical range map of the coyote appears to overlay well with where the tall grass and mixed grass prairie range occurred historically. Yes. Is there any evidence that this historical range tells us about how they evolved as a medium-sized predator in that range? I, I, that's an excellent question with a great perception. It does tell us quite a bit. We do have to remember, though, that the range map, the original range map, was drafted by we uh, Euro-Americans, and that some alter a significant alteration, both the vegetation and the animal communities had already occurred. So it's quite likely that even our historical range map is missing quite a bit. A big issue of um, how and why coyotes are now found in such a gigantic geographic range is one of the biggest alterations we've made is we've eliminated one of their biggest predators and competitors, which is the wolf, the gray wolf. Um, so that greatly limited not only where coyotes could be, what prey was available to them, but also the likelihood that somebody would have seen a coyote out in daylight because they were, they were definitely living in a landscape of extreme fear at that time. All right. 
Well, you get a bonus for that. You answered two questions for the price of one. So the, the second oh. question was, <laughs> was, is the reason for the large expansion of the coyotes the extirpation of the wolves or near extirpation? And you would say yes. So yeah, no, that I, is a major contributor. Another would be our, our human modification of the landscape. So if you think about uh, how we have changed the other parts of the landscape, vegetation-wise, and where the other wildlife species are able to use. So the spread, for example, of white-tailed deer beyond their historic and natural geographic home range versus where mule deer and pronghorn were has really got a lot mixed in with human agriculture and residential development. All right. So I was just fascinated when you st started at the beginning about the Native American stories, all the legends that talk yes. about coyote. And then I looked at the range map and I could see that there was a lot of Indian country there. And then you started talking about management. And I thought, well, golly, I wonder how the tribes manage coyotes, if, if mm -hmm. they manage it any different than us, because they have this, this role that they see coyotes in legend. I can't speak certainly for all of the different cultures and people who were here originally, but I know of at least one set of cultures, and uh, I believe it was the northern region of the Southwest, that actually, um, interestingly, it, um, the way I would interpret it and understand I'm a wildlife biologist, not a sociologist, but they actually created social taboos about going after coyotes. So if a person even saw the, the carcass of a dead coyote, there were procedures that were needing to be done to bring that person back into balance to the whole system so that for, there's an implication that if you were out of balance through either harming a coyote or even seeing that dead body, that maybe coyote depredation of your crops would be more or something like that or maybe your success at hunting and fishing and gathering would be lessened because you were out of balance so again that is just one small very limited example uh, we cannot uh, expand that to all cultures but that's one example excellent i can really see how a child growing up in that culture would not want to feed coyotes so right like, exactly like most you know wisdom it it had some real wisdom behind it so this next question is about the the dens can you describe the size mm -hmm. and structure of a coyote den i'd have to go back and look at actual size dimensions but what i can say is that like many other parts of their ecology they're very opportunistic so under a dead or rotted log or beneath a rock pile or uh, even I've heard, you know, in the dirt um, or soft crawl spaces of abandoned buildings. So it's pretty much any place that is sheltered um, in some way able to be um, what's the word I'm looking for that that can be monitored carefully um, that's accessible to the other partners in the pack to bring food in, but also somewhat protected and gives good visibility for protecting the pups, especially in those first few weeks. All right. So we have a couple more I want to do before we do our polling break, because I noticed we've already okay. lost a couple people. It's that time of the show. Uh -oh. um, so okay. these both of these questions have to do with interaction between coyotes and dogs. So Excellent. first one, I'll ask both and then you can deal with them together. Do coyotes okay. ever play with domestic dogs? We had one approach mm -hmm. two golden retrievers on our property and appear mm -hmm. to initiate play. So that's the good mm -hmm. side. Then this is the evil mm -hmm. side. Do coyotes mm -hmm. lure dogs from the area around the house into the woodland to kill them? Mm -hmm both of those yes but i think they're part of the same uh escalation so coyotes one of the things that they can do so well and i probably should have gone into this more with that photo of the dog coyote nose to nose 
um, picture is coyotes are exceptionally good at displaying submission or play, saying, oh, I am I am no threat to you, golden retriever. I, I'm actually kind of scared of you. I might even release a little urine the way a puppy would. I'm going to open my mouth and show my teeth. I may even beg you to regurgitate food for me because I am just a sub-adult and I'm very, very vulnerable. Um, once they do that play bow, which you've probably seen where they slam their legs down, they put their butts up in the air, they wag the tail, they know how to do that really well. Then, you know, just like with dogs, the next part is the chase sequence. So we go running around, we get the zoomies. Sometimes it stops there, and that can look like play. Sometimes it's just getting you closer to the hiding structure in which the rest of my pack mates are, and that's where an attack and a depredation can happen. And uh, I mentioned terriers and other species with high prey drives. I, I just very recently uh, had a barn hunting friend lose her strongest uh, sport dog to a pack of coyotes through that very mechanism. And this is somebody who knew better but let the dogs off leash so that they could enjoy, they were hunting rats or something out there in the field. And her lead female had the highest prey drive and then was uh, the most vulnerable to being led into the blackberries and killed by the, and partially consumed by the coyotes. Wow. It sounded like yeah. a great adventure movie, but not a good one. Not a good no. one. No. So I'm going to say that we uh, take a break from questions to give you a chance to uh, drink some water. And I want to do okay. a couple things. First, I'm going to share our polls with our audience. This again, I know this is the time of the show when people start drifting away. And before you do, I would like you to vote in our next poll. This one is our wrap up poll and we won't share the results of this and I'll leave it up off to the side. Um, once you vote, it goes away for you. So overall was the material presented useful to very useful to not at all useful and what's your overall satisfaction very satisfied to totally not satisfied and will you use the information from the webinar in your work or leisure and i needed to launch it so you guys hadn't even seen it yet here i was talking about it that's the risk of being the moderator so now dana i would like you to Reshare your slot, your screen, so you can show us the two slides about the upcoming show, or the slide about the upcoming show, whichever. I think there are two of them. So perfect. Yes. So next week we have two webinars for you at 10 a.m. on Tuesday. Steve Fitzgerald is going to talk about forest management methods, or as you might know them, silviculture. Um, this will be talked about from 10 to 11:30. Um, Steve is a, a favorite of Tree School. Um, and what he normally does is he does a morning and an afternoon in the woods classes. He's combining both of those, just the inside part to, to give us this webinar. Next slide. And then in the afternoon, um, you guys get to have yours truly. Uh oh, too fast there. Um, myself, Mike Clossy, and Joe Goldsby from the Department of Forestry. We're going to talk about Oregon forest protection laws. That'll be from 3 o'clock to 4.30. And I'm um, going to talk about the new illustrated manual and uh, stuff like that. Joe has some great examples about SSBT. And if you don't know what SSBT means, you really need to come to the, the show next Tuesday afternoon. So go ahead, Dana, and switch it back to the slide with Steve. I don't want to sound like I'm advertising myself. And I will click on some more questions for you. So um this question has to do with uh there's part about wolves and part about um cougars so first you mentioned that there aren't a lot of natural predators now in the population that the coyotes are facing so are wolves and cougars predators for the coyotes and both of those we've seen an increase in their population so what's likely to happen as cougars and wolves increase, is that going to put pressure on the coyote population? I, I think that's another great set of questions. Um, 
where we're seeing increase or returns of those larger predators, what we'll see is the multi-predator relationships will start reestablishing. So in the places that we've got wolves again, or we've got increased cougar visitation, we'll likely see coyotes going back to their original role, which was probably sticking to being present or being most active in the crepuscular hours and overnight hours, sticking to the edges, being, again, taking full advantage of those observational powers to make sure it's safe to come out and feed on that animal carcass. Or uh, even, you know, one thing I didn't mention was that our hunter gut piles out on the landscape where we, we clean our animals as we hunt them, that's turned into another uh, source of food for the, the lucky animal that comes across it, where any of those resources is going to be something that a coyote smelling, hearing, seeing, knowing that their potential predators and competitors are nearby, they're going to be much choosier about which opportunities they take a chance on taking. What that might mean, and I'm waving my arms and speculating here, is we might expect that animals that are in that region are then going to naturally seek the safest places. And that may end up being closer to human habitation because as they spread, those larger predators are still going to retain their natural uh, hesitance to come right up to humans. They have not yet been rehabituated to human presence yet. So we certainly see that sort of island effect with deer, for example. They, even in a full predator area, tend to hang closer to human buildings and things like that because it's just a little bit safer. Interesting. Just all centers around us as usual. I'm um, afraid so. So this, again, think of coyotes being sneaky. So can coyotes howl? So it sounds like there are more than one of them, more, than, more of them than there really are. Yeah, I don't know if we could attribute it to sneakiness. They definitely have, uh, depending who you ask, anywhere from six to a dozen different vocalizations, some of which are multi-tonal. So it, to us, it may sound like multiple individuals because they can get that whine while they're doing their howl. Uh, but to my knowledge, they don't have a, a control over trying to project more than one voice at a time. All right. So what kind of estimates are there available about the, the density of coyotes in different parts of the state and are they growing more in the urban or the rural and you know what's the future look like i think that would be a great question for me to do further research on but especially to check in with our biologists at odfw because i really don't have access to i'm not sure that we're even assessing coyote density um Interestingly, counting animals can be one of the trickiest uh, things that we do in wildlife management because they, they won't fill out a survey for us. But um, I would say, though, that certainly in Oregon, given that we may or may not have been part of the main natural range, that densities now compared to historically are likely up. Um, I would say in the suburban high density human areas, definitely densities are higher simply because those situations are ones that are still being um, created or still developing. Um, and urban and suburban areas, it's turning out, can be very high value food islands for coyotes for all the things I mentioned, and then also interestingly, because uh, the commensal rodents that come with the building of human cities. So we're seeing more rats and mice and various uh, rodents that hang out near humans. So that turns into quite, quite a resource in and of itself. 
All right. This is unrelated. It's not uh, rats, but a uh, person was wondering, kind of tongue in cheek, but there's probably some reality here. Um, do coyotes eat mountain beavers? I sure hope so. Um, yeah, they actually do. So in, <laughs> interestingly, uh, I was just reviewing some diet information. There've been a lot of studies of, of coyote diets and interestingly, they do eat mountain beaver, uh, into a pretty high percentage of their diet. Again, we have to put little parentheses around that seasonally because they really do flex their diets according to what is most available during a given season, but they do they do eat them. So yes. <laughs> well, while we're on diet, um, this this is related to one. Are coyotes any threat to young trees? You mentioned that they're uh, omnivores. Do they eat seedlings? Mm. Uh, not to my knowledge. No. All right. Well, that's good for tree farmers. So the, the yes. next question is related to that. What impact would a silvicultural practice such as clear cutting, where we have more open, more brushy land, mm -hmm. what might that have on coyote and maybe cougar populations? Well, it really depends, I would say, on what kind of understory or what management we're doing within those patches. Um, so hypothetically, those patches, especially in the, the early years as forbs and shrubs start growing vigorously, that should be really rich habitat for a number of species, including deer and elk. Uh, the reality of how we sometimes manage those patches, though, is that it's not necessarily how it plays out. Um, I do know that what we have seen in some of the Western Oregon cuts is a an apparent abundance or possibly even a boom in, for example, pocket gopher populations as that understory gets thinned out or, or eliminated. So there's still plenty of grass and forbs available. Um, and so once the rodent population spikes, then you might get to see coyotes hanging out there. That is provided, however, that you've got coyotes ranging through the surrounding area. If it were heavily forested, that might be an area that was being used more heavily, things like mountain lions. So uh, that might not be an area that a coyote would want to chance going out in the open. It really just depends on, on the context. There, there would be food opportunities certainly out there for coyote though. All right, excellent answer. Even the tough questions you're handling so well. So well, thank you, they're this good questions. This is escalating, I'm afraid. So these are both <laughs> talks about, um, questions about the laws and when we wanna control mm -hmm. problem animals. So first of all, can you kind of review the laws, what a, a farmer or a rancher needs to go through to, to get rid of a problem animal? And second, um, this is the mm -hmm. tricky one. What is your opinion of untrained local folks doing the hunting, not for fur, mm -hmm. but these are the ones who really want to reduce the packs? Yeah, um, well, I'll handle the first one first. So the first, because they are, they have multiple statuses. There are quite a few species and eat, especially our Western states that have multiple legal statuses. So coyote is one of those. It is down as an agricultural predator species that can be taken on private ground. Um, it then also can be considered a, what's called a managed species as a fur bearer, in which case then you switch into, I need a license, I need a fur bearer um, stamp, I need to report my, my take. Um, in part because of their potential effects on, on people's livelihoods, as well as that dual status, my very first move is going to be to get a hold of my district wildlife biologist with my state management agency. Say, so what do you recommend? Because they are likely, again, these district biologists are more local in nature. They are more likely to have a broader landscape view of what your neighbors might be doing um, in terms of their management. 
for or against them um, that can help you get some perspective. In an agricultural situation, you're also able to call on APHIS, as I mentioned, um, to request a technical assistance. So they may, that means, you know, giving advice, essentially informed advice. Uh, if the damage levels meet whatever threshold they have for being able to actually send an agent out, you may be able to engage them in helping to reduce the population. Um, so that would be almost tied for first in terms of my recommendations. Um, I believe your next question was, what is my personal opinion? Um, well, I don't know that I'm here to, to really uh, opinionize uh, to everybody. I would say that given what I know as an ecologist, um, and somebody trained in the management of wildlife, that Taking pot shots at individual animals is likely to just educate them. Um, if, it, if it kills that one, it's going to be educating the others that are observing. And that I know that that means that you're going to have a more, shall we say, highly educated pack. Um, my concern then is that the next round of confrontation is going to be that much trickier and much challenging because you're dealing with uh, a, a foe that knows our moves a little bit better. Um, and at that stage, if you bring in a trapper uh, from the government, for example, they're having to deal with animals that have now gotten habituated to avoiding our attempts to depredate them. Um, there's also the risk that um, if somebody, just like anything with firearms, if we happen to make a mistake in knowing our target, we could very uh, unfortunately end up taking a, a domesticated animal that looks a little wolfy or a little coyote. Uh, of course, if it's engaged in destroying or damaging livestock, that is another matter too, so. Great answer. So got three more questions, unless they add some more, which somebody just did. Um, and we're going <laughs> about um, 10 minutes, nine minutes. So we're doing good here. Um, I think we might get right. so that. So far you've been dealing a lot of ones about prey and people. This, this one mm -hmm. is really two questions about the pack. Um, what's the yeah. size of a typical pack? And what's the kind of social structure? Is it, you know, female dominant, male dominant? How do they behave as a pack? Yeah, uh, it's highly variable. Uh, the pack size, uh, generally though, in, generally in a pack, only one pair is breeding. So we often hear about alpha wolves. Um, there's a, in coyotes, similarly, there's likely only going to be one pair doing the breeding. Uh, and similarly to wolves, in an extremely rich territory where a pack has territorial rights, shall you say, um, over an area that's very, very rich, there are times and circumstances where a beta female may be allowed to breed, but generally there should only be one breeding female in the group. Now, the size of the pack uh, is just really highly variable. Um, it depends on how rich the habitat is in terms of food, what can be supported, what size group can be supported, um, the size of the prey that they're needing to take on. Now, there is the one very, very odd case uh, so we don't often hear about coyotes killing human beings, but there was one, uh, I believe it was British, Southern British Columbia, uh, a young woman who was known as a singer and published and everything was killed in an area by a pack that local authorities estimated to be 22 animals. Um, this doesn't mean, however, that large packs are higher dangers to human beings. What's extraordinary about the case is not only the size of the pack and not only 
that a human being was actually killed. I mean, this was so odd that when I heard through professional channels that this had happened, I won't say the word that I said, but it was one of great disbelief. Um, that area the, the area, yeah, everybody in the area knew that humans were deliberately feeding coyotes by hand there. And so this woman and other hikers were walking into a population that had been trained to see humans as a source of food. So um, that's kind of getting off track, but that, those were all, that was already a very large pack. It's quite possible that there were so many animals tolerating each other because humans were bringing them food. So. All right. Scary. Bad humans. So back to more biology. Um, do yep. coyotes use the dens every year, the same den, or do they move around their territory? And kind of related to that, how territorial are they? Yeah, the, so I'll take the den one first. They can reuse dens. Um, in any animals um, that use what I'll call earth shelters, whether it's a burrowing pygmy rabbit or um, any of the burrowing animals or coyotes using dens or bears using uh, dens. There's an advantage to reusing something if you can, because it saves you a lot of energy that you would otherwise use maintaining and, and digging it out. The downside is that those dens can be places, they can become habitat for your body parasites, such that uh, when you, if you come back to a den that's still got, for example, ticks and fleas and pinworms that survived the year, then there's a really good chance that your puppies are going uh, ridden with these animals at higher rates. So they can reuse dens, but some variability of whether or not you would want to use a den uh, one year and then come back like, oh, you know, there was this other place. We really did well over there. So um, I'm sorry. What was the second question? Territoriality. Are they territorial? Ah, territoriality. They, they can be. Yes. Um, in general, they, they do protect their core hunting areas, core areas. Um, in an extremely, it depends on the, the um, distribution of the resources. If there are plenty of resources where and you have a neighboring pack or a neighboring pair, it's quite possible that you would overlap in the areas you use, but you would not overlap in being there at the same time because there is a high risk of conflict at that stage. And, and most animals, regardless of their species, do what they can to avoid conflict because conflict can lead to injuries, it can lead to death. So All right. um, they are territorial, but not, I wouldn't say that they're um, as territorial as wolves are famous for being. Right, good. So before I ask the last question, I have to ask you to switch slides to the previous one so they don't have to look at my mug any longer in two places. At least they only, nope. Okay. One before that with that Fitz. One. We're going to give Fitz some, some deals here. So All last right. question. Um, yep. Your mention of homing behavior is fascinating. Can you elaborate yes. on this in terms of instincts and specific behaviors? And maybe just re re replay for us what you meant by homing behavior. Yeah, homing behavior is just to literally home in on something. Um, we think of the word home as being our central place. And I think that's where the terminology came from is that we always come to our central place or our home. Um, and I'm not the best person to address it in terms of all of our knowledge or theory. I'm not a behaviorist or an ethologist, but I do know that many different species from, uh, for example, hawks that we have to translocate to keep them safe and to keep us safe at Portland Airport, for example. They sometimes, to give animals every chance of trying to make it, 
they will translocate an animal that's tried to locate its uh, hunting range inside the airspace there. And those animals literally have to get on a flight and be flown hundreds of miles away so that when they attempt to home back to Portland International, they eventually, if we can take animals far enough away, sometimes they'll give up before they die and they'll stop. Um, and it, it is a fascinating thing. Um, we certainly see that in the urban interface with uh, a more common wildlife and human conflicts such as that opossum or raccoon that gets into your attic or your shed, uh, that simply the law limits our ability to translocate them to our own boundary or property line. And that I, I tell people, I warn people, the chances of you beating them back to the door are low because they have four paw drives. And uh, we have to do a lot of work no matter how far we move them to keep them from getting back into where they were because that's the place to which they orient. Um, I, I don't know of the full ecological basis of that, but I would imagine that there's significant natural selection advantage to an animal that is able to at some deeper navigational level know where its place is and to get there in case in the, the course of a hunt or foraging, that it's like, oh, oh I'm at the end of the, my knowledge of the woods, I better turn back. Where is back? And I, I'm certain that it's tied to that somehow. The animals that didn't know how to do that likely wouldn't survive long enough to pass on their genes. Good point. Excellent answer. Boy, you, your, your presentation was fabulous, but your answers to the questions are even better. So I want to thank you. And this is applause from all 90 people who were tuned in today, which is great. And then I want to thank, thank the you. people that tuned in. We really appreciate it. Um, we love doing these webinars. And I think, you know, we're, we're hitting a, a need. And so we have two more next week. Um, again, in the morning, Steve Fitzgerald will be talking to us about silviculture systems. And in the afternoon, Joe Bodes, me and me will be talking about the Oregon Forest Practice Rules. So thank you all for joining us. Thank you, Dana. And everyone, have a great evening.